Regular meeting number 34 will come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. This evening, uh, Council is pleased to welcome Dr. Latrice Washington of Monolith Baptist Church to come forward. Dr. Washington, thank you for praying with us this evening. Let us pray. Our gracious and wise God, we just come to you inviting your presence in this place. Pleased grant wisdom and understanding, insight and foresight for all of the decisions that will be made here today that will impact the lives of residents of Ohio. We thank you that we can come to you in prayer, that you hear us and you will grant our requests. It's in the name of Jesus I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hart. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications? Yes, uh, President Hardin, members of council, I have two items tonight. First, a letter addressed to the city clerk from the Franklin County Board of Elections, dated June 28, 2019, stating the following. I hereby certify that the board has examined the part petitions for initiated charter amendment clean energy received excuse me, that is initiative petition, clean energy received by our office from you on June 20th, 2019. The numbers of valid and invalid signatures on the part petitions for the prospective initiative are as follows. Total signatures 14,948, valid signatures 9,705. Percentage of valid signatures submitted relative to the total number of raw signatures 64.9%. The total number of voters, electors that participated in the 2015 general municipal election for mayor was 177,793. The number of electors who represent 5% of the total electors is 8,890. Please let us know if we may be of further assistance. Sincerely, Jeff Mackey, manager, petitions and filings, Franklin County Board of Elections. In addition to the the communication from the Board of Elections, the City Clerk has forwarded to members of City Council City Attorney Klein's memorandum dated June 27, 2019, regarding legal sufficiency as required by Section 42-9 of City Charter, which states the City Clerk shall, upon receipt, forthwith forward to the Council the Election Authority Report regarding signature validation and the City Attorney's findings regarding legal sufficiency. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any resolutions by members of council? Councilmember Elizabeth Brown. 
Councilmember Mitch Brown. Yes, Council President, I do have one resolution this evening. I would like to ask uh, Chief Fire Chief O'Connor, Safety Director Pettis, and Dr. and Mrs. Keswick to please approach the podium. <coughs> resolution 0202X2019 to recognize Dr. David P. Keswick in honor of his 32 years of service, uh, distinguished service with the Columbus Division of Fire. Whereas Dr. David P. Keswick has been proudly serving the city of Columbus as medical director for the Columbus Division of Fire since 1987, and whereas leading by example, Dr. Keswick's compassion and care for his patients has created the culture of patient advocacy within the Columbus Division of Fire. Under his leadership, our EMS care providers have not only effectively treated patients in alignments with transport, which will transport them to the hospital, but they supply compassion on what can be the most stressful and difficult day of someone's life. And whereas through his service on the editorial board of the Journal of Emergency Medical Services, his faculty membership to the U.S. Metropolitan Medical Directors Consortium, better known as the Eagles, and in his local and national leadership positions with the organizations such as the National Association of EMS Physicians and the American College of Emergency Physicians, Dr. Keswick has been on the forefront of EMS research nationally and whereas Dr. Keswick has continued the Columbus Division of Fire's tradition of excellent pre-hospital care that began with the Hartmobile in 1970 through numerous initiatives that have significantly impacted our community's response to public health crises, including heart saver CPR, first aid, automatic electronic defibrillators, stop the bleed, and naloxone training classes, the Heart Safe Columbus Task Force, and the deployment of the Mobile Stroke Treatment Unit. And whereas during his tenure as medical director, Dr. Keswick has partnered with Ohio Health, the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, and the Mount Carmel Health Systems to ensure patients receive consistent and integrated care at every step of the healing process. And whereas Dr. Keswick's philosophy, bring the care to the patient, not the patient to the care, has inspired all the Columbus first responders to think of the patient's well-being his holistically, and now therefore be resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby express its appreciation for the outstanding contributions that have been made by Dr. David P. Keswick during his 32 years of public service to the city of Columbus, and this council congratulates him on his retirement. Do I have any comments from my colleagues? If not, I move for adoption. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Dr. Chief O'Connor, would you make some comments, sir? Good evening, Council President, Council Pro Tem, um, all members of Council. 32 years ago, Dr. Kessick became our Medical Director of Education. What he saw over that 32 years has led us from about 200 EMS runs a day to today's where we take over 550 EMS runs a day. He's um, been insightful, he's brought leadership, He's brought input to the two of the most significant changes to our EMS system. Back in 1994, there was a major change to our system, and back in 2017 was an update to that. His leadership has led to us leading the nation as EMS providers. It has also led to the fact that the Columbus Division of Fire is one of only a handful of fire departments in the entire country that has an EMS education department that is nationally accredited. This couldn't have been done without his leadership and input. The members of the Columbus Division of Fire, every man and woman that's a paramedic and an EMT, has learned from his capabilities, his knowledge, and he's made us better so that when we go out there in the streets and um, on any given day, any resident of Columbus can know that they're getting the best EMS care available. I want to thank Dr. Kessick for his 32 years of service. I want to especially thank his family and Jeannie for sharing him with us, and I wish him all the best. Thank you. Director Pettis. President Hardin, members of council, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words and to uh, express a few memories uh, that I've shared with Dr. Kessig. Uh, my working relationship uh, started with Dr. Kessig when I was uh, promoted to captain in 1991, and I was charged with setting up the Internal Investigations Unit, which is now the Professional Standards Unit. Because I was not a paramedic, I regularly called on Dr. Kessick for interpretation of EMS protocol and EMS policy. And so our relationship uh, grew from there. I was appointed fire chief in March of 2002, 
And shortly thereafter, I began transitioning Dr. Kessig from part-time medical director to full-time and a member of my executive staff. The next year, in 2003, Dr. Kessig and I went to Seattle to review that city's EMS operations, and we paid particularly close attention to their cardiac arrest survival rates, their AED public access initiative, and their citizen CPR program. We came back and implemented our own EMS improvements and increased our city's uh, average cardiac arrest survival rate. And I believe Dr. Kessig will tell you we more than doubled our cardiac arrest survival rates in the city of Columbus. The fire chief in Seattle back then was Greg Dean, who is now the fire chief in Washington, D.C. And the medical director was Dr. Michael Kopus, one of the EMS pioneers from the Hartmobile days. Dr. Kopus, by the way, was a legend in EMS medical direction, and the award that Dr. Kessig won in 2012 as the best EMS medical director in the country is named after Dr. Michael Kopus. That award, the Michael Keyes Kopus Award, is awarded to that emergency medical services medical director who has demonstrated long-standing service, contributions, and leadership in the unique realm of out-of-hospital emergency care, and who, in addition, has served as a role model not only for emergency medical services personnel, but also for fellow 911 system medical directors across the nation. A few examples of innovations attributable to Dr. Kessig's work include the addition of CPAP, and intranasal medication administration to our medical medic vehicles, along with the development of CFD destination policies for patients having heart attacks and trauma. Dr. Kessig led the division's participation in research trials like the ASPIRE trial that looked at mechanical CPR devices. That was what prompted the division to add mechanical CPR devices to EMS officer vehicles along with intraosseous IV drills. Dr. Kessig also supervised the establishment of activities for our EMS week, including our cardiac arrest survival ce celebration, which is now bigger than ever. Like Dr. Kopus, Dr. Kessig has been a national legend in EMS medical direction, and he will be sorely missed. In addition to being my colleague and coworker over the years, Dr. Kessig became a valued friend who I will always admire. Congratulations, Doc. At this particular time, before I ask Dr. Kessig to say a few words, I do have a uh, guest speaker who uh, is going to come forward. Oh, my God. <laughs> Members of council, <laughs> President Hardin, when council member Mitchell Brown asked me to be here for this historic event, there was no way that I could say no. I had to be here to pay homage <laughs> to this outstanding public servant. Uh, it's important that you understand that Dr. Kessick and I, what, we've got what can only be described as a love-tolerate relationship. <laughs> For the last several years, I have had the distinct honor of emceeing the cardiac survivor celebration that Dr. Pettis mentioned. It is an incredible ceremony. I invite all of you back next. Well, you won't be there, though, will you? OK, all right. But I invite all of you to take part in it next year. It's an emotional event, and it celebrates those heart attack survivors who have been brought back to life, I mean literally brought back to life by members of Columbus's finest, the CFD. And a lot of that is due to the fine training they have received under programs instituted by Dr. Kessick. It's a very emotional ceremony. I love being a part of it. I love helping to tell the stories of these survivors. The only downside, every year, I get what I consider to be a less than sterling introduction by Dr. Kessick. There's an ever so slight snarkiness in his tone when he reads my rather lengthy list of accomplishments, but that's to be expected. It's understandable. 
Because you see, Dr. K and I are both very proud products of Columbus City Schools. We are alums of two high schools from the South Side. Dr. Kessig allegedly graduated from Marion Franklin High School, while I graduated from the glorious, outstanding seat of learning at 1160 Ann Street, the Columbus South High School, home of the Mighty Mighty Bulldogs. At the time, Dr. K and her, we were both in high school, probably at about the same time, there was an intense rivalry, really bitter rivalry, between South and Marion Franklin. There could only be one king of the South, so it was kind of like a high school game, game of thrones. It got kind of ugly at times. <laughs> Dr. K and I, for whatever pitiful reason, have carried that rivalry out of our teen years and into our golden years. We just bring it out in each other. We just can't help it. But in spite of our differing opinions on the superiority of our respective high schools, I do have a lot of respect for the incredible work that he has done to build up what has to be the premier EMT department on the planet. So representing the citizens of Columbus and Columbus City School graduates from one old bulldog to a very old red devil, and I'm wearing the colors for you. Thank you for your service and happy retirement, and you know I love you. <laughs> Dr. Kessick, the floor is yours before she leaves. Wow, yeah. <laughs> boy, oh boy, now that was a surprise. You got me on that one, boy. Oh. <laughs> I did want to clarify one remark she made, and that's that I was about 10 years after she graduated, <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, President Hardin, Councilmember Brown, members of council, uh, I'm truly honored by this very uh, distinguished and, uh, and wonderful award. And Councilmember Brown, thank you so much for your thoughtfulness and members of council for your recognition. Um, I will say that uh, it has been an honor and a privilege for me to have been uh, given uh, the, the medical director role here for 32 years with the Columbus Division of Fire, an organization that is, uh, had a rich legacy of uh, excellence, starting with the Hartmobile in 1969, and then advancing to where we are recognized across the world for all the wonderful things we're doing. And I want to say that the only way we could have accomplished that reputation is with the support of our city council, our city administration, our fire division, and, and truly the citizens of Columbus. Uh, we are really blessed here in this city in that everybody plays well together. We don't have the rivalries that a lot of other cities have. And we have people like uh, our Director Pettis, uh, Councilmember Brown, our Chief O'Connor, uh, and our leaders in city administration who value the health of the citizens of Columbus. My job as medical director was made very, very easy because... You all supported what we wanted to do, and that was to make sure that our patients here in Central Ohio got the best possible care. So we were supported by you when we wanted to add equipment, add medications, add medics uh, and vehicles, <clears throat> and make sure that we were able to save lives uh, and uh, help the health care of our folks here in Columbus. So my job, a privilege, an honor, uh, and just uh, so unique in that I had all this support that a lot of medical directors around the country do not have. So again, I thank you, uh, my friend, Councilmember Brown, uh, and all the members of council, Chief O'Connor, Director Pettis, and all my, uh, my friends back there sitting uh, in the uh, aisles back there. Uh, it has been a privilege for me to be able to serve as your medical director. Thank you. I have to admit, personally and professionally, I've known Dr. K for quite a long time. Uh, and I will say to the citizens of Columbus that we are going to miss him significantly. 
Um, we have worked together. Uh, we have had conferences together. Uh, and it's a rare circumstance when your medical director gets so intimately involved as Dr. K did. It wasn't just a circumstance whenever we had uh, some crisis, we called him in the middle of the night, he would always be there. If we called him in the middle of the day, he would always be there. Even when he was out of town, we would call him, he would still figure out a way to be there. Uh, that, that is unique in today's society. And for me in particular, Dr. K, it's a special honor to say congratulations, a career well served. Uh, I move for adoption, Council President. You've already passed it, so we're in good shape. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Doran. I'm glad I don't have any resolutions tonight because that'd be hard to top. <laughs> um, just one thing, I wanted to uh, make an announcement about my uh, community hours for July. I'll be holding th uh, that later this month on Tuesday, July 23rd at the Linden Library on Cleveland Avenue from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Uh, as you know, my practice is to feature a pizza place from the neighborhood that we're in, so we'll be having pizza from Terry S. Pizza which has served the North, North End for more than 50 years and has always been family owned and operated. Uh, so if folks are interested in joining me out that night, I can attest the uh, probably the best sausage pizza in the city. So that's all I have tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Favor. Thank you, President Hardin. Uh, no resolutions, but just a brief announcement. Well, happy July, everyone. We're officially through 2019, which is just unbelievable. Uh, but this month, we'll be hosting three sets of community hours. Our first round of community hours will kick off next Thursday, July 11th, uh, from 9 to 10.30 in the morning at Dunkin' Donuts, located at 1325 Bethel Road. That is all. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Mimi. Thank you very much, Council President Hardin. Um, last Thursday, we had the opportunity to uh, unveil and launch the new Colum Columbus Police app, and uh, things are going very well. I saw Deputy Chief um, uh, Jennifer Knight um, this today, and we've already received some tips, but if you haven't had the opportunity to do that, to download the app, it is available at the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. Um, we ask people to download that. It's a great way, a community engagement tool to um, have the opportunity to engage with our police, to submit reports, to submit tips. You can do it bo both with your information and anonymously. You can chat back and forth with a police um, officer as well. So we're hoping that people take this time to, to download the app and utilize it to keep extra sets of eyes out there in the public. And we're specific, specifically hoping that people use it uh, for red, red, white, and boom. So um, we're excited with the opportunity to engage our community and certainly feel that uh, it's a, a good tool f of technology. So thank you to uh, Council Member Brown, who was the chair of safety for allowing us to get that off the ground and we're excited to have that. Also just wanna wish everybody a very happy and safe 4th of July. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Tyson. Well, I have one resolution and I do have to follow Council Member uh, Brown, but uh, equally excited to recognize um, and honor Somali Independence Day. So I'd invite folks who are, are down uh, to support to come forward as I read resolution. And everybody can come down, yeah. I have resolution 0201X-2019 is to recognize and celebrate July 1st, 2019 as Somali Independence Day in the city of Columbus. On July 1st, 1960, the trust territory of Somaliland and Greater Somalia United to form one country. It's a day that inspires a sense of gratitude and patriotism for Somalians worldwide, including right here in Columbus. Uh, I'm proud to recognize July 1st as Somali Independence Day and to celebrate the strength and culture, cultural heritage of our Somali American uh, community who make up Columbus and makes Columbus great. I'll read just a couple uh, stanzas from uh, the resolution. 
whereas the city of Columbus is home to one of the largest and fastest growing Somali communities in the world, and whereas it is estimated at least 60,000 Somali uh, immigrants and refugees live in central Ohio and the city of Columbus, with an estimated 200 Somali immigrants per month arriving in the region, and whereas, like many immigrant communities uh, before them, Somali Americans have made their journey to the United States seeking a better life, but also to add to the diversity and vitality of our community. Um, we are uh, so grateful that we have such a strong Somali community. Really, uh, we are the city that we are because the Somali community is strong here. And so we are uh, excited to, um, uh, to pass this resolution uh, as we recognize uh, Somali independence. Do any of my colleagues have any comments? Councilmember Remy. Thank you very much. I had the distinct pleasure of joining uh, the celebration yesterday at uh, Cleveland and Ennis and just to see so many great people and all the flags. It was very, very exciting to join everyone out there. Um, we, we know that uh, you're a vibrant part of our community and we appreciate all the contributions you make uh, to the city of Columbus. Um, you know, a couple things. We got to uh, meet a camel yesterday in Council Pro Tem, uh, Liz Brown and I, and uh, learn a little bit about cam camels as it relates to Somali Somalia. And then um, we also know, um, as many of you have let us know, that this is the largest Somali uh, population within, the, within a single city in the United States. And so we know how much you uh, mean to us here in Columbus, and Columbus just wouldn't be what it is today without your contribution. So thank you so much, and, and happy Independence Day. Thank you very much. That's my President Pro Tem. Um, I'd like to clarify, we didn't just meet a camel. The we went up to take a picture with the camel, and the camel like snuggled right up next to Councilmember Remy's face. It was really great, and we, I got an actual picture of it too. So, <laughs> um, but, what? Yeah, he did. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, but in all seriousness, um, thank you, Council President, for presenting this resolution today. Um, it is our honor to uh, celebrate Somali Independence Day. Um, the Somali community in Columbus, uh, as Councilmember Remy said, truly is what makes our city, um, is part of what makes our city so great. And it would not be the same city without the contributions of all of our Somali residents. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you for being a part of this resolution today as well. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. Hassan Omar. City Council members, Honorable President, first I would like to say thank you for inviting us here today. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, one thing that I want to share with you, first time I came in Columbus was 1995. And there were only 35 Somalis who were living in Columbus. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, the Somali community has been growing uh, gradually. And as you mentioned today, there are over 60,000, and we are hoping more to come because Columbus became the fastest growing city in the nation. At the same time, it became the hub of Somali community in the nation. Whenever we have a convention or meetings, people leave uh, Toronto, DC, Atlanta, uh, Chicago. This has become the central location mm -hmm. where everybody can be reached. Also, we have every year a soccer tournament uh, from 28 states, including Canada, and Columbus has become one well-known destination. Even in back home in Somalia, there's a village that's called Columbus in Somalia mm. because the people who live right here always feed and help for those people. They build the schools, they build like clinics, they help, and they send every month over $20 million back home in Somalia. So we are grateful to be here, and we're grateful to be in Columbus. And also I want to mention to you that even though people are saying uh, Minnesota got the largest Somali community in the nation. Columbus got, as a city, the mm. largest Somali community in the nation. So I'm hoping that uh, we will continue to grow and also to make our relationship greater and, and bigger. Yesterday we were refugees, today we are US, U.S. citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, President Hardin, members of council, for adopting this resolution. Uh, as a proud Somali-American, I immigrated to this country 15 years ago. Uh, I didn't speak a word of English. I went to, graduated from Northland High School, went on to The Ohio State University, and graduated from law school right after that. 
Uh, Somalis have immigrated to Columbus in the mid and late 1990s, and we have an estimated 60,000 Somalis that call Columbus home. Similar to previous immigrants, uh, they are doctors, lawyers, engineers, public servants, and have contributed much to our city. This resolution is a testament to our city's leadership and that I'm proud to live in a city that is welcoming to the immigrant community. I think given what's going on at the national level, this is much needed in this community. So I do wanna leave you just with just one last word, which is I wanna remind you the words on the Statue of Liberty, quote, give me your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. These are not words, these are American ideals and I'm proud to live in a city that lives up to those ideals. Thank you so much, Council President. Thank you, members of Council. Hello, everybody. My name is Kauthar Musa, and I'm glad to be here today to participate and celebrate July 1st at uh, City Hall of Columbus, Ohio. Um, if, I, if I say a little bit about the Independence Day of Somalia, uh, the Independence Day of Somalia is a national holiday observed annually in July 1st. Uh, the, the date celebrates the unification of uh, trusted treasury of Somalia, the former Italy, Italian Somalia, and the states of Somalia, the former British of Somaliland, and the states of uh, Somalia, uh, which formed the Republic of Somalia in July 1st. Um, in general, so it's a public holiday. I'm excited because I feel like I'm like more than happy to be here today. So. Um, Yesterday was really a big, big day, and it was the largest ever event in Somali community hostess in Central Ohio. We have been invited, more than 3,000 of community members, including city officials, uh, Councilman Rimi and Councilwoman uh, Alitha Bass. Thank you both of you coming yesterday. We really appreciate it. And we hope you guys again see you next year, and all of you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ms. Hodan. Thank you, um, council members and council president Harding. Um, I don't want to say much, but came here to say thank you for recognizing the Independence Day of Somalia. Um, you know, it has been a great day and for the Somali community, and we would do more than celebration for the years to come. Um, we're thinking about doing, um, there's two independence days for Somalia, June 26th and July 1st. The northern part of Somalia, which is now the Somaliland, uh, has got their independence on June 26th and the United North and South on the July 1st. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking about not only celebrating that one day, but the future, we're thinking about doing a Somali week from the 26th to the 1st. That's Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Ms. Adan. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, um, all um, elected officials and the staff members and everybody here. Thank you so much. We really appreciate. I also want to say happy July 1st to all Somalis and happy July 4th to all Americans, including Somalis. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. My name is Southern Mohammed. I work with a number of organizations that I am the founder, and also I am a mother of seven kids. If I was not here in Columbus, I, have never, uh, I would never understand the need of the community. So being part of Columbus community, I'm very happy for that, and thank you again, everybody. Thank you. With that, is there... I'm not going to say much, but thanks for having us here. It's been a great honor to be here today. And I just wanted to say Happy Independence Day to Somalia. And July 4th is coming, so we have two celebrations to do. So thanks for having us. Thank you. With that, uh, I'm going to move for adoption. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Adopted. Thank you. Are there any comments by uh, our elected officials? I see Ms. Pegg here from South London. How are you? Are there um, 
Are there any requests by members of council for the removal of ordinance or resolutions from the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the city of clerk? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Thank you. Will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation on the agenda? Finance Committee, Ordinance 1717-2019, Public Utilities Committee, Ordinance 1625, 1641, 1659, 1702-1716-2019, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Resolution 193X-2019. We don't have any speakers on the consent portion of the agenda. Will the, uh, the following orders now appear on our agenda as consent action? Will the clerk now read those into the record? Resolution of Expression 203X and 205X-2019. Finance Committee, Ordinances 1583, 1683, 1709, and 1722-2019. Recreation and Parks Committee, Ordinance 1572-2019. Education Committee, Ordinance 854-2019. Public Safety Committee, Ordinance 1658-2019. Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 1267, 1453, 1455, 1479, 1501, 1515, 1616, 1618, 1645 and 1666-2019. Technology Committee, Ordinances 1439, 1443, 1503, 1602, 1706-2019. Public Service and Transportation Committee, Resolution 194X-2019. Ordinances 1591, 1604, 1631, 1633, 1644, 1656, 1670, 1733, 1734, and 1736 Housing Committee, Ordinances 1698 and 1699 2019. Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee, Ordinance 1615 2019. Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinance 1715 2019. Workforce Development Committee, Ordinance 1537 2019. Appointments from the Mayor's Office, numbered A0095, 96, and 97 2019. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have one speaker on the consent portion of the agenda, Mr. Nathaniel Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins, welcome back to Council. Mr. Wilkins is speaking on uh, Ordinance 1699 in the Housing Committee. Sixteen twelve, Arlington Avenue, Mr. Nathaniel George Wilkins. Uh, speaking in against of uh, CA, CA 37, uh, 2019, holding the land bank of 1549 Briarwood Avenue. I'm just going to give you two options. The reason why I'm, uh, I'm against this property is holding the land bank is because it, it, it doesn't give any opportunity for anybody for a speeding process for any property that sits in the land bank for quite a period of time. I'm just going to give you a one prime example because I come down here all the time and uh, to talk to you. The um, reason why I'm against 1549 in Briarwood, there, there's several property in the state of Ohio that sits idolized, vacant, and abandonment. So, and, and again, this is a prime example of 1666, 1664 Cleveland Avenue in South Linden, multiple duplex for quite some time. But again, with, with 1549 O'Brien Wood holding the land bank, I want to know that this particular property in North Linden cannot be used for habitat or any side dispenser of a yard, but it could be used for low-income housing. So again, I need to know what is this property going to be used for, but not for rental property, not for habitat, but home ownership for low-income residents. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. I'm going to ask uh, Director, do you have a response? Um, yes. Uh, thank you, President Harden, members of council. This property is being sold to a, a private property owner who's planning to build a new home on the property and sell it for home ownership. Thank you, Director. Are there any other questions or comments by my colleagues? 
Seeing none, I uh, may have a motion for approval of these items as an consent action by voice. Is there a second? Please call the roll by voice. Ms. Brown? Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes, with the exception of 1537-2019, on which I am abstaining. President Hardin? Yes, consent agenda items are passed. We will now proceed with the second reading of 30-day and tabled and emergency legislation. The first committee to come before council is the Finance Committee. It's chaired by President Pro Tem uh, Brown. Uh, council Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. Uh, tonight in finance, we first have uh, Ordinance 1745-2019 to consent to the issuance of parking garage improvement revenue bonds by the Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority to finance additional costs associated with the Ohio Center parking garage project and to declare an emergency. The consent of the city is required prior to the issuance of notes, bonds, or other obligations of the FCCFA. This ordinance will provide such consent for the issuance of $6 million in parking garage improvement revenue bonds. These bonds will be used to finance additional costs related to the Ohio Center parking garage project. These bonds may be purchased by the Franklin County Treasurer and will be payable solely from parking facility revenues received by or on behalf of the FCCFA. Other than providing consent for the issue of 2019 bonds, the city has no financial obligation regarding the development of the Ohio Center parking garage. Any questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. President Harden, may I move to Recreation and Parks Committee? That's all I have in finance. Thank you. Um, tonight in Recreation and Parks, we have Ordinance 1730-2019 to authorize the uh, development director on behalf of the city to enter into a development agreement with Franklin County and Crew SC Stadium Company, LLC, regarding the financing, development, construction, operation, and occupancy of a new multi-purpose sports, entertainment, cultural, and recreation facility and the redevelopment of the Mafre Stadium site into a community sports park and the financial commitments for all parties involved. This ordinance represents the next step in the agreement among the City of Columbus, Franklin County, and the new Columbus Crew Ownership Group to keep the team in Columbus. I'd like to start by taking a moment to thank the Save the Crew members for their ongoing advocacy throughout this process. Your dedication and organizing activities demonstrated not only the passion of crew fans, but the possibility of what community can accomplish when people join together. Thank you. And I also want to recognize the efforts of the new ownership group led by the Haslam and Edwards families. They not only stepped up to keep the crew in Columbus, but they have made a commitment to ground this hometown team even closer to our community. Just last week, I attended the groundbreaking of a new mini pitch donated by the crew to Eakin Elementary School. We were joined by several kids in the neighborhood who got to meet four of their role models, crew players who scrimmaged them afterwards. This dedication was one of many community partnerships to come. In the agreement we're passing tonight, the ownership group has pledged $50 million in community impact over 30 years. That's important because from the beginning of the city's involvement in this process, our priority as council has been to ensure that these projects provide a clear public benefit to our residents and neighborhoods. That means job creation on one hand. These projects are expected to support more than 600 construction jobs and once complete are projected to support 775 full-time permanent jobs. But not all jobs are created equal. The ownership group has committed to spend a minimum of 30% of the total value of the two public projects with certified minority and women-owned business enterprise consultants, contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers. Already, they've been working closely with the city's Office of Diversity and Inclusion to help meet these goals. I want to thank Director Demita Brown for your hard work so far in this effort. We know it's just the beginning. As we plan for the new home of the crew, we are not, just preventing, we are not preventing the old stadium from falling into disrepair. Instead, uh, we are proactively redeveloping it into a true asset for the area, the Columbus Community Sports Park. 200,000 residents live within three miles of the site, and it will benefit, uh, it will greatly benefit these residents with increased access to recreation opportunities. For the city's part in the deal, the city will leverage 
$140 million in private investment by contributing $50 million towards costs associated with design and construction of the community sports park, public infrastructure near the downtown stadium, and other project costs not associated with construction of the stadium. None of the city's $50 million contribution will go to construction of the stadium. As we move forward with this process, I look forward particularly to working with Director Paul Rakoski and his team to continue soliciting feedback from residents on how this facility can best meet the needs of the community and make a positive impact for the residents and especially the kids of Columbus. We do have some speakers here tonight on this ordinance. Uh, before we move to them, I would like to give a chance uh, for our two directors uh, to speak, and we also have an area commission member here um, who would like to speak. So first, um, Director Shoney. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown, President Hardin, members of council. Um, very excited to be here tonight. This is the next step. This is not the final step, but this is the next step in a project that really does bring together all that we are trying to do in our city. Uh, we are trying to bring together a city that works together, a city that creates jobs for all different kinds of people in our city, and a city that takes assets and challenges, and, or takes challenges and turns them into assets. Um, a couple things that I would highlight in addition to the great introduction that the council member gave. Um, a lot of times when we bring jobs, when I bring jobs to this council or I bring a project that creates jobs to this council, it falls into fairly narrow bands of the kinds of jobs that are going to be created. One of the unique things about this project is it does create a very wide band of the types of jobs that are going to be created. Um, but one thing that we have concentrated very hard on with the ownership group is to make sure that they're quality jobs across the board. So there will be jobs um, at the high end of the scale. There will be jo entry level jobs for everyone to participate in. So we're very excited about that. We are very excited about the progress we're already making on the uh, minority women owned and local contracting side. We had an event at New Salem Baptist Church on Wednesday last week where we had, I believe, over 100 people um, come out and have the opportunity before the plans are done to meet with the prime contractors uh, and begin to develop those relationships and get ready to bid on those so that we are positioning our, uh, our local businesses, our women-owned businesses, and our minority businesses for success in this massive construction project, or actually the series of massive construction projects. So we're very excited about that. And uh, one of the things that we've been very pleased um, to have happen is to develop a partnership with the Edwards family and the Hasm Sports Group. And one of the things that we frankly have learned is um, how to work with them on doing community outreach. I've had the opportunity to participate in a couple of community outreach meetings with the Hasm Sports Group folks. They're bringing their knowledge about how to work in a community and how to bring community impact from the work that they've done with the Browns uh, to Columbus. And, and as a Bengals fan, and I know uh, Council Member Mitch Brown <laughs> It's painful for us who are fans of other teams to give that compliment, but it is nonetheless true. They are bringing that knowledge to our community. And one of the things that they are partnering with, with us on is having an, a community engagement committee that uh, will be bringing members of the community into their process, um, into understanding how they are making their community investments so that it's not just them doing things in the community, but the team doing things with the community. So um, very excited about the project. I want to thank uh, Director Demita Brown for her um, groundbreaking work as we've worked through the diversity and inclusion pieces. And then uh, Director Rakoski and, and um, Tony Collins before him have been fantastic partners, um, lots and lots and lots of hours on conference calls and also compliments uh, to both the city attorney and the city auditor. Um, projects of this size don't get done without complete teams. So thank you. Thank you so much, Director Shoney. Um, next, uh, Director Paul Rakoski. President Pro Tem Brown, President Hardin, and members of council, I'll be brief in my comments, but I'm also very excited, even though my project's a little bit further down the road because of the timing of all the other wonderful construction projects that need to happen. But if it wasn't for this 
public-private partnership, we wouldn't have the opportunity to build this sports park uh, here at Baffrey Stadium. <coughs> and the partnership that we've had in the past with the crew has been a really solid partnership. And I'm very excited to look forward to the future when we're co-located on the same site and all the wonderful things that we can work together on at that site for the community and for the kids in, in the community. So, you know, it'll be about this time next year <coughs> and we'll start designing uh, heavy design of the, the first phase of our project, which will be the, the, you know, the tournament fields that we're going to build on site. And we'll be reaching out to the community at that point and have a really robust uh, engagement with the community to make sure, we, you know, everyone's seen some of the, the, the site plans and some of the drawings, but those are just some suggestions that we put out there to make sure that, you know, we can fit uh, the amenities that we'd like to talk about on that site, but there will be a very robust uh, engagement with the community to make sure that they're getting what they feel they need to get out, out of this wonderful project. So again, thanks to everybody that's been involved in this. I will tell you all negotiations are, are, are they're always inherently difficult. This is a great group of people to work with and their commitment to the kids in, in, in this city and their issues with their foundation and education are only going to make this a really wonderful partnership moving into the future. So thanks again. Thank you, Director Rakoski. Um, and I would like to reiterate Director Shoney's thanks um, to Auditor Kilgore um, and City Attorney Klein for everything that they did to um, help make sure that uh, we could keep, keep the crew in Columbus. So thank you, Auditor. Um, and then finally, and then we will get to uh, proponent and opponent speakers, but we do have a member, an area commission member here, and um, she would like to speak on it. So why don't you come to the podium, because sometimes those don't work. Ms. Peggy Williams. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be very brief because I can say ditto for what you said, <laughs> and I can say ditto for what Steve said, and I can say ditto for what Paul said. So I'll close my little brief statement out with um, acknowledging those 200,000 residents that will benefit, includes neighborhoods like the American Edition, Arkell Park, Clintonville, of course, Linden, uh, Milo Grogan, and the Wyland Park. Uh, we'll all, we've all been actively engaged in the current development process of this venture, and we're looking forward to the next 30 years. So I commend the foundation, the Columbus Cruise Soccer Club, and Mr. Peter Batiste, together with the City Department of Neighborhoods and City Parks and Recreation staff for demonstrating their good faith commitment to ensuring development occurs responsibly and re re, uh, responsibly. Since the early announcement of each project, all six communities have been actively engaged in discussion surrounding accessibility to the residents as the immediate need to resolve. So I support Council's passage of Ordinance 1730-2019 regarding the redevelopment of the Mop Free Stadium site into a community sports park. So that's all I got Great. to say. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Williams. And, um, I never like to go without the opportunity just to thank you as an area commission member. Our area commission members do work week in and week out to support our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's all volunteer work. Yeah. So thank you, yeah. okay. truly. Sure. Um, we do have, we, we will take um, maximum of three proponent and three opponent speakers. Um, we have one opponent speaker, uh, Mr. Brett Adams. If you'd like to come to the podium. Um, welcome back to council. You have, um, please name and address and um, any group affiliation, and then you have three minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, President Hard, members of council. Uh, 583 East Broad Street. Uh, first, I'm happy to see that my speaker slip was handled appropriately this evening. Uh, now, on a positive note, uh, opponent's not the right uh, adjective. Uh, we support the crew. I support the crew. I was very outspoken in keeping the crew here initially and very uh, much a proponent of the downtown uh, stadium, as long as you don't overpay for the land, which is obviously what's happening now. But the elephant in this room is the Columbus Partnership, the same partnership which mishandled the original negotiation. 
Although much praise should be given to the partnership for its mission to help this region, it's not always correct in determining what's best for the taxpayer. Blindly following the partnership, which has been done in the past, has led to an arena that we can't afford, a dilapidated Clipper Stadium, a casino on the west side instead of downtown, and a veterans museum that's ultimately going to be subsidized by the taxpayers. But what you'll do this vote today, what you will do with this vote today, is not your due diligence, and you've accepted all these representation of the partnership without doing your own research. The Haslam's going to build a downtown stadium. Man, that's fantastic. That's fantastic for all of us. But it should be with their money, not our taxpayer money, unless there's an appropriate public partnership, which I don't feel that we have here, especially because the, the main focus is the MAPRI redevelopment. Um, I, I, you know at this point, the state was not consulted. The Linden leadership was not consultant, consulted. The OBET city, city manager was advised 15 minutes before the press conference to say that, oh, by the way, we're going to keep the crew here in OBETs. Well, there's a little bit of a problem with that. There's no lease. It expired December 31st. And now because the partnership announced the exact location uh, of the land purchase, uh, I can't imagine where these negotiations are or what you're going to pay. Nationwide's a lot of things, but they're not stupid. Um, and who announced this grand plan? This was the Columbus Partnership. So my personal frustrations, um, this, this manipulation of, of, of Linden. When I first addressed uh, this issue with city council, uh, someone in your administration sent me the Linden plan. Well, the problem is that MAPRE is not in Linden. It's not part of this plan. And then the efforts to try to end run what we've been doing with this 30% minority thing, which is fantastic, but build these facilities in Linden and make it 100% minority owned. Um, don't, uh, and I ask all of you, um, how are these kids going to get to this park? Ride their bikes down Hudson? Are you going to let the kids in when the crew are practicing? Has anybody thought of these questions? These, these kids, this is not Upper Arlington, these not New Albany. They don't have the transportation to use this park. They just don't. Uh, and I'm going to run out of time, but I hope you ask me some questions because I'm not finished. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Adams. I appreciate your, your input. You can have a seat. Thank can you. Yes, Council, I mean, Chairman Brown, I certainly met with Brett Adams and some of the questions that he asked. I, I asked um, Director Shoney as well as I certainly asked the, um, the, the Haslams and... Um, these questions and certainly to um, I feel comfortable that they understand what is needed this issue around transportation when she's brought up again today I have brought it up in two meetings that I've had to make sure that young people have the opportunity to be able to get to this facility if you're asking about young people in Linden certainly many of them don't have transportation to get there and other young people because I want to make sure that it has access to all children in our community and that um, they've assured me that transportation will not be a concern that they will make sure that our young people have an opportunity to get to this facility and also when I met with um, Mr. Adams, he certainly also suggested that uh, that kids of color don't play soccer. And certainly I had to share with him, yes, they do. And that, um, and that we want to make sure that um, given access, and this facility will give access to even more young people, that they will be able to come and play soccer there. But they're already playing in different facilities, and we want to make sure that all kids have access to come to this facility. And I've been assured that that will not be the issue. I mean, and certainly of all the issues they talked about, that particular one I think will easily be handled. I certainly believe that um, Ms. Brown will ensure that we're going to be watching that 30 percent, uh, up to 30 percent of this, this development will certainly have minority and female representation. So all the issues that he has brought to our attention, I certainly, because I met with him, I absolutely brought each of those issues up, and I have been satisfactorily answered um, from those issues that he brought up today. Thank you, Council Member Tyson. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to uh, just again thank Director Brown um, for your work. I know that you were, 
you know, you were a part of the conversation in this commitment towards 30% too. So, you know, you have a plan to get us there in, in working with the ownership group. Um, this is not an arbitrary number, but something that we believe in and that through your leadership, you know, I know we'll all, we'll all work towards. Um, so thank you for that. Um, next we have um, Mr. Adam Troy. Welcome to back to council, Mr. Troy. Um, name and, and address, and you have three minutes, sir. Thank you, um, President, Count, President Hardin, members of council. My name is Adam Troy, and for the purposes of tonight, uh, I reside at 2956 Cleveland Avenue, uh, which is where our church is located. If need be, you can take 3116 Willow Springs, which is also in zip code 19 as well. But tonight, I have the honor of speaking with you on behalf of our Community of Development Foundation, which serves as the nonprofit 501c3 Community and Economic Development arm, of, as many of you know, of New Salem Church. My presence this evening reflects, in fact, our support of the proposed development agreement with Franklin County and the Crew SE Stadium Company regarding the financing, development, construction, operation, occupancy of the new multi-purpose sports, entertainment, cultural, and recreation facility, and the redevelopment of Map Free Stadium site into a community sports park and the financial commitments of all parties involved. As outlined in the legislation before us, the city and the crew ownership have indeed made a sizable commitment for MBE and FBE participation in the construction and ongoing operations associated with the team. In fact, as you know, and has been stated, the new crew ownership have committed to spend, I believe it's actually a minimum of 30% of the total value of the two projects with certified minority and women-owned businesses, enterprise consultants, contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers. The stadium, mixed-use development, and sports park are projected to support more than 600 construction jobs and 775 full-time permanent jobs once built. That's significant. To that end, and most recently, our CDC had the pleasure of working alongside the city's Department of Diversity and Inclusion, along with the Department of Neighborhoods, in partnership with the Columbus Crew SC, representing representatives and hosting a minority and women-owned business enterprise community information session, whereby more than 150 attendees came out to learn about the projects and bid opportunities related to the new Crew Stadium and Sports Park. As an entity, whose daily mission is to create a connected community and to speak truth to power on behalf of those who are often minimized, marginalized, and sometimes simply misunderstood. We believe that this commitment is real and that both entities are working to ensure that economic opportunities are attainable for minority and women-owned businesses, particularly from the Linden community. While some may say, and rightly so in part, this is not a perfect piece of legislation for our community, However, it is indeed forward thinking and holds above our collective heads, public and private, sacred and secular, commerce and community, a crown of economic inclusion that challenges us to grow tall enough to wear it proudly as a genuine community impact demonstration, in fact, of the Columbus Way. In closing and on behalf of the New Salem Church and the Community of Caring Development Foundation, we respectfully thank you for the allotment of time and look forward to having the, the opportunity to return to this council in the coming months with meaningful indicators of positive progress for, for minority and female-owned enterprises as we continue to advance our daily mission and our work in the marketplace of creating a connected community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Troy. Um, next we have, other comments from colleagues? Uh, next we have uh, Teresa Arabar, principal at Eakin Elementary. Principal Raybar, welcome to council. Good to see you again after the, the mini pitch announcement last week. Most certainly. Um, good evening, Principal, um, evening Council President Hardin and Pro Tem Brown. Um, my name is Teresa E. Raybar, and I am the proud principal of Eakin Elementary, which provides quality education opportunities to nearly 300 students each year, starting in pre-K through fifth grade. We are also the home of the exciting new state-of-the-art mini-pitch that was officially dedicated this week on our city's west side. 
On behalf of our superintendent, Dr. Chalisa Dixon, and our Board of Education, I am here to share our appreciation for the powerful partnership between Columbus City Schools and the Columbus Crew. For more than a decade, Columbus Crew Soccer has been a major contributor to our mission of empowering this city's young people from our youngest learners in pre-K to our graduating seniors heading to college. This team and its players have played host at their current stadium of, to our City League Soccer Championships, supported the high school and middle school soccer teams at Linda McKinley STEM Academy, provided elementary reading tutors and mentors as part of our Columbus Reads and Reading Buddies programs, built a playground for our young pre-K students at the Linden Park Neighborhood Early Childhood Education Center, and refurbished the soccer fields at Medina Middle School. Each year, the Crew um, Foundation has provided scholarships to our students' athletes who took to pursue college education. Recently, the team and its corporate partners dedicated not one but two newly designed and upgraded STEM labs for the students at Lynn McKinley. And last weekend, the team hosted our partners at NBC4 and offered free tickets to anyone who donated to our Stuff the Backpack campaign to give every Columbus City Schools student a backpack full of supplies on their first day of class. All of those efforts say a lot about the team's commitment to our Columbus community. And now my school and our students benefit from the team's latest reinvestment back into their community, the new mini pitch at Eakin Elementary, and the U.S. Soccer Foundation's Soccer for Success After School program. Young people in our neighborhood are truly excited about this mini soccer field with building goals and lights. Healthy bodies fuel active minds, and playing sports is a proven way to keep children healthy, teach them to work successfully as a part of a team, and boost their energy and confidence. And I think to the future, 10 years from now, and believe that the next Columbus Crew All-Star is going to be one of my students whose soccer dreams started on that mini pitch. Columbus City Schools is proud to have the players, staff, and new ownership of the Columbus Crew, along with the city's Recreation and Parks Department, and Columbus City Council playing on our team and supporting our students on and off the field. So let me close by saying emphatically and simply, thank you. Thank you, Principal A. Raybar. Thank you. Comments? Any comments? Okay. Um, and we have one final speaker, um, Morgan Hughes. Mr. Hughes, welcome back to Council. Um, you uh, name and address, and you have three minutes. Uh, my name is Morgan Hughes, 1065 Summit Street. Uh, and 617 days ago, I walked into this room and spoke to you as a representative of a newly formed grassroots organization that was less than a week old. On that day, the sting of the announcement that our community was facing destruction was still fresh. And while we were beginning to develop into the globally recognized phenomenon that we would eventually become, on that day, we really didn't know what we didn't know. We stood before our city council and we asked for your help. It was admittedly a fairly broad request, one that maybe lacks specificity on a real tangible level. But instead of dismissing us as a group of people who didn't have it all together quite yet, you instead collectively recognized us for what we could be. You chose to see and believe in what our movement would become. And even though you didn't have to, you stepped up and became passionate allies in our battle to save the crew. I'm here again today on behalf of Save the Crew to say thank you and to tell you how proud I am to be a resident of this city and a member of this community. When I was here speaking to you for the first time 617 days ago, I talked about how the world would be watching how this all played out. And I knew that however this saga ended would create a lens through which people would view Columbus. And as that view is coming to focus, it is obvious to all what this city values and what our people stand for. Where another city may have rolled over and let an absentee owner rip a cherished community asset away, the city of Columbus said, no, it is not going to go down like that. We're going to fight this. Where every other American city in a long history, these kinds of fights ultimately ended up losing, we won. It didn't matter to us that it had never been done before anywhere, ever, because this is Columbus, and we are a city of firsts. 
This is a place where never been done before only means that there's an opportunity to write our collective names into the history books as the first to do something that everyone else told us was impossible. And where another city might let the Moffrey Stadium site fall into disrepair, we instead choose to redevelop it into a space where the youth of our community can and will play their games and dream their dreams for generations to come. It would be all too easy to walk away from that underserved neighborhood, but just like you did before when you stood up for us, when we weren't yet the best version of ourselves, you're now choosing a different path, one of revitalization and one of investing in the future of a neighborhood that will now have brighter days in front of it than it did in its past. I applaud you all for choosing that hard path because it is the right path to choose. When the grassroots movement known as Save the Crew started, we had one simple goal in mind, get the right people together in the right rooms to make the right decision to save our community from being destroyed. And thanks to rooms like these, and thanks to people like you, the final resolution of this saga is beyond our wildest dreams. So on behalf of every single person that will benefit from all of your hard work, it is with endless gratitude and a very, very, very full heart that I say thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hughes. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? All right. Um, well, seeing no further um, public comment to come before council on this matter, uh, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. I forgot my job. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Dorrance is passed. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, the next committee to come before Council is the Public Utilities Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Dorrance. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. Uh, first tonight in Public Utilities, we have Ordinance Number 1470 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into an agreement with emh and T for Professional Engineering Services for the Franklinton Area Stormwater Sewer Improvements Project for the Division of Sewer and Drainage. Stormwater section to authorize the appropriation and transfer of funds from the storm sewer um, reserve fund to the storm sewer bonds fund in the, in the amount up to $1,100,443.74 to authorize an expenditure of up to $1,100,443.74 from the so storm sewer bond fund to authorize and transfer an expenditure in the amount of up to $1,166,774.23 within the Storm Sewer Bonds Fund to authorize the appropriation transfer and expenditure of up to $150,999.55 from the Storm Build America Bond Fund to authorize the appropriation transfer and expenditure of up to $110,828.12 from the Storm Recovery Zone Super Build uh, America Bond Fund and to amend the 2019 capital improvements budgets. Um, this project is in the Franklinton area is one of the blueprint, blueprint areas where green infrastructure will be constructed along sanitary infiltration reduction. While keeping in mind Blueprint Columbus is an innovative way of eliminating sanitary sewer overflows while also investing in neighborhoods and our local economy through building green infrastructure all across our city. Um, by improving our stor storm sewer capacity, this project will mitigate street flooding and encourage continued development and investment in the Franklinton area. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Um, next is ordinance number 1504-2019 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to renew a professional engineering agreement with Arcadis US Inc. for the Sanitary Sewer Blueprint Miller Kelton Newton Bedford project to add a funding to the Division of Water as a Newton Bedford Waterline Improvement Project to authorize the expenditure of up to $988,928.03 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund to authorize an expenditure of up to $20,345.14 from the Water General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2019 capital budget. Uh, this project includes replacing or rehabilitating approximately uh, 2,300 linear feet of water mains within the Near East planning area. 
The replacement of these water lines will improve, improve water service, decrease burden on water maintenance operations, and reduce water loss. Uh, the water line work was bid concurrently within the sewer project. The same design firm is being utilized um, because the work, over, the work areas overlap and the, and the same survey and base maps can be utilized. This will allow for significant cost savings in the design of the project. The two projects will be constructed together and will reduce the construction impact on the neighborhood since all the work will be, con will be completed by a single contractor. Um, do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Rini Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. Next is ordinance number 1548-2019 to authorize the director of public utilities to enter in a construction contract with John Ermo and Sons, Inc. for the Mound District Booster Station 20-inch discharge line project to authorize the appropriation and transfer of $3,013,538.42 from the Water System Reserve Fund to the Water Supply Revolving Loan uh, Account Fund to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of $3,013,538.42 from the Water Supply Revolving uh, Loan Funding ac Account Fund to authorize an expenditure of up to $2,000 within the Water General Obligation Voted Bond Funds to provide for per payment of prevailing wage services to the Department of Public Service uh, for the Division of Water and to authorize amendment to the 2019 capital budgets. Uh, this project will construct more than 5,000 linear feet of water main in the Mound District Booster Station, which services the Greater Hilltop area. Um, this water main is needed to reinforce the existing distribution grid and improve water services in the area. Um, do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Finally, we have ordinance number 1823-2019 to authorize the uh, appropriation expenditure of funds in an amount of up to $969,520.62 from the 2019 Community Development Block Grant uh, Revolving Loan Fund to authorize a, the Director of Public Utilities to execute a construction contract with Danbert Electric Corp for the Cleveland Avenue Decorative Street Lighting Project um, and to declare an emergency. Um, this project consists of installing 78 decorative street lamps with LED luminaries and, and replacing eight existing luminaries on Cleveland Avenue from Weber uh, to Dunning Road. This project will also involve upgrading the underground wiring system. This work is being performed within the city's goal um, to light every street. The addition of street lighting to this area can provide a sense of security and additional visibility on this important roadway in our community. Um, this may potentially draw additional residents to the area as, as well cause them to uh, free, as well cause uh, additional business development within the area. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Thank you, President Harden. That's all we have in public utilities this evening. Thank you, Chair. The next committee to come before council is public service and transportation. Council member, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harton. Tonight in Public Service and Transportation, we have ordinance number 1662 uh, to authorize the Director of Public Service to execute agreements with and accept funding from the Ohio Department of Transportation relative to the Pedestrian Safety Improvements, SRTS Sidewalks, McGuffey and Duxbury Project and to declare an emergency. This ordinance is in relation to the Safe Routes to Schools program which aims to improve the safety and mobility of children by encouraging them to walk and bicycle to school. This effort will culminate in sidewalk installation along both sides of Duxbury Avenue, from Lexington Avenue to Hamilton Avenue, and along both sides of McGuffey Road from Duxbury Avenue to the end of the existing sidewalk just north of Clinton Street. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Thank you, President Harden. May I move to rules and reference? Sure. Thank you. Tonight we have um, ordinance number 1763 to enact sections 107.02, 107.03, 107.04, and 107.05. I'm reading the wrong one. I'm like, this is not making sense. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. To start over mm -hmm. okay all right so tonight in rules and reference we have ordinance number one five four seven 
to enact and repeal various sections of the Columbus Nuisance Abatement Code, there's my language, in order to create and administer civil penalties for owners of properties who fail to comply with notices of violation and current correct code violations that create public nuisances. This legislation will create a code to address Title 47 nuisance abatement codes against blighted properties that become public nuisances and allow civil penalties of up to $1,000 per day against the owner of property for each calendar day that the owner failed to comply. This code change will align with similar language in our code that was legislated back in December of 2014. Ordinance number 2714-2014 and reference to Title 45 of the Housing Code and Title 41 of the Building Code, which enacted the $1,000 administration penalty for violations to the Housing and Building Code. This legislation will expand the reach of the civil administration penalty to include public nuisance violations as enumerated in Title 47 of the Columbus City Code, which is the city's nuisance abatement code. This legislation does not impact the city's ability to take civil or criminal action against property owners who remain in violation of the code, nor the city's ability to assess any costs associated with abating a public nuisance violation to an owner's tax duplicate. In December of 2018, city officials settled the largest public nuisance lawsuit in the city's history with AMG Realty Group. AMG was cited for an extensive history of continued violations of city housing, nuisance abatement, health, sanitation, and safety codes covering over 802 units at three properties. The Department of Development utilized the nuisance abatement code to get the property owner's attention. In addition to resolving all of the outstanding code violations in a timely manner, the settlement ensured that the premises of the three apartment complexes would continue to be in compliance with our city's code. AMG agreed to pay the city a $50,000 administrative fine that is being put towards the eviction prevention program. This case is an example of the process working and ensuring that the owner will comply with orders and provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing for our residents. Director Shoney, do you have anything else you'd like to offer? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for that great summary. Um, the, I, I'd also like to point out an example that just came through today, um, which is a case where we actually didn't have to institute the fine, but we had a property owner who we'd been struggling with. Uh, they had 306, at one point they had 360 violations on the property. Um, last month, I signed the letter saying that the next step was for us to institute $1,000 a day fines. This month, 360 units are in compliance. So we don't need these tools to get to the point of filing court cases and running fines, but sometimes um, deterrence works. And I think it's also important, important to highlight that this is a tool that's used for our most egregious cases, yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I would move for passage. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Best. Thank you. That's all, President Harden. Thank you, Madam Chair. At this point, I uh, ask for a motion for recess or a second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Council is recent. Regular meeting number 35 will now come to order. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. We will now go to the zoning committee. Councilmember Tyson chairs that committee. All members serve. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you. We do not have any speaker slips today, so I'll go directly to um, the ordinances. So the first one is 1672-2019 to grant a variance for the, from the provisions of sections 3353.03, permitted uses of the Columbus City Code, so property located at 3726 North High Street, to permit first floor residential use or single unit dwelling in the C2 commercial district. The applicant is Igul Humshiva. The proposed use is first floor residential use or single unit dwelling. The, the C Department's recommendation is approval, and the Clintonville Area Commission's recommendation is approval. I first move to amend to emergency. Call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Amend it. Thank you, and now I move for passage. Please call the roll. 
Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. The final ordinance is 1695-2019 to rezone 259 Park Road, being 18.25 acres located on the south side of Park Road, 230 feet west of Storrow Drive from LAR-12, Limited res Apartment Residential District, to L LAR-1, Limited Apartment Residential District, and LM Limited Manufacturing District. The applicant is Wilcox Communities, LLC, care of Jeffrey L. Brown, Attorney Brown, the proposed use is a multi-unit residential development and a self-storage facility. The city department's recommendation is approval, and the far north, far north Columbus Communities Coalition recommendation is approval, seven to one. I move for approval. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favorite, Remy Tyson, President Hart. Thank you. And that's all I have in the zoning committee this evening. Thank you. Seeing no further business coming for the zoning committee, I move for adjournment. Is there a second? Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Adjourned. We will uh, reconvene special meeting, no or meeting number 34 momentarily. Regular meeting number 34 may now, now come to order. May I get a, a motion to reconvene? <laughs> He's called the row. So, Brown, Brown, Doran's right. favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Uh, we are reconvening uh, meeting number 34. We're going to the Economic Development Committee. Council Member Remy chairs that committee. Uh, Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. Tonight I have uh, in Economic Development, I have ordinance number 673-2019 to accept the application of NAIL ESCN for the annexation of certain territory containing 1.957 acres in Franklin Township. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues this evening? Seeing none, I move for passage. Oh, I got to take it from the table. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. First, I move to take it from the table. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Removed. Next, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Hopefully by the end of this, we'll have it all together. <laughs> all right, next I have ordinance number 1595, 2019, to authorize an appropriation of 2,500,000 from the Neighborhood Partnerships Capital Fund to authorize the transfer of appropriation within the Development Taxable Bond Fund to authorize the Director of Development to enter into contract with Columbus Next Gen Generation Corporation to purchase, renovate, or construct real property assets in targeted central city areas to advance economic and community development initiatives to authorize the expenditure of Four million three hundred fifty thousand from the development taxable bond fund in the neighborhood partnerships capital fund and to declare an emergency. This ordinance authorizes the director of development to enter into contract with the Columbus Next Generation Corporation in an amount up to four million three hundred fifty thousand for the purpose of purchasing, renovating, and or constructing urban real property assets in targeted central city areas to advance economic and community development initiatives. On October 3rd, 2012, City Council passed Ordinance 1968-2012, which established a nonprofit development corporation, Columbus Next Generation Corporation, for the purpose of advancing, encouraging, and promoting industrial, economic, and commercial development in the City of Columbus and named the City of Columbus as the sole member of the entity. This corporation is charged with eliminating blight and creating job opportunities as well. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Pass. The next four res um, ordinances uh, revolve around um, speculative office space or warehouse space down in the uh, Rickenbacker area. Uh, first ordinance is 1646, 2019, to authorize the Director of Development, uh, Director of the Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with Mission XC LLC for building number six for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a total proposed capital investment of approximately 37 million, including 33,500,000 in real property improvements and $3,500,000 in furniture and fixtures and the creation of 60 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated new annual payroll of approximately 1,872,000. I do have um, one speaker on the on this uh, ordinance this evening, and that speaker is Mr. Joe Motiel. Mr. Motiel, welcome back to council. You have three minutes to speak, and please state your name and your address.
Good evening. Uh, Joe Motil. I reside at 167 West Cook Road, Columbus, Ohio, President Hardin, Pro Tem Brown, members of City Council. My testimony tonight is in reference to this legislation and the following three tax abatement requests related to real estate developer Mission XC LLC. Another tax abatement to a company that has been around for about 35 years and making millions of dollars in land development in risk-free logistic locations around the country. And it's laughable that the public should believe that this developer is going to spend $61.5 million on developing nearly 1.6 million square feet of prime logistics real estate for warehouse distribution space located in the heart of Rickenbacker Distribution Center on speculation. Rickenbacker is strategically located within a 10 hours drive of 47 percent of the population of the United States, 33 percent of Canada's population. As of last year, the vacancy rate for distribution space at Rickenbacker was just under 4 percent. And it is predicted that due to an increase in e-commerce, more land at Rickenbacker will be developed and millions more in property tax revenue will be lost due to this and other unnecessary community reinvestment areas that are no longer required to attract investment. But you continue with these handouts and even create more CRAs like the one in the Kenny and Henderson Road area of Northwest Columbus for the benefit of your developer friends. The City Council's tax incentive policies continue to be counterproductive while contributing to homeowners' increases in property taxes, especially those hurting those on fixed incomes and senior citizens. 30% of foreclosures in Franklin County are due to homeowners not being able to pay their property taxes. And of course, there is never-ending disregard for eradicating millions of dollars in revenue that are needed to properly compensate our Columbus Public Schools educators and provide for the needs of our public school students and its school buildings. These well-heeled developers in corporate Columbus need to pay their fair share of property taxes like everyone else. But of course, you like to think that this tax abatement savings of almost $15 million is a good trade-off for 84 jobs paying $15 an hour and six jobs at $25 an hour. $15 an hour jobs that have no public, public mass transit to get to and are located outside of the 270 outer belt. Jobs that are probably gonna require employees to travel upwards to 45 minutes to get to. And it is well known that many of these Rickenbacker warehouse operators send their employees home without eight hours of work or even four hours of work sometimes when volume is low. So they're not even guaranteed a 40-hour, five-day work week. And many of these jobs lack any type of health or retirement benefits. This is just another example of unjustified financial aid to a wealthy developer that burdens working families and keeps those in poverty stagnated. And after these combined tax abatements of nearly $15 million is undoubtedly approved tonight, City Council will have approved no less than $282,270,415 in tax abatements over the last 45 months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Motil. Director Shoney, would you like to uh, comment on these four pieces <laughs> of legislation? Um, thank you, uh, Chair Remy, uh, members of council. Um, a couple things uh, relating to uh, the specific comments that Mr. Motil said tonight. The market in the Rickenbacker area is strong. It is doing well. Um, one of the challenges that we face in attracting jobs to our city is that we do not have available space that's ready to move into. Um, there are other markets around the region that have more of that. One of our challenges, whether it actually is with the warehouse industry or uh, with Class A office space, is making sure that we have properties available to move into when the businesses are ready to move into that. That's why we feel it's very important to come in for speculative, whether it be office or warehouse space, and be engaged with those. Um, we've repeatedly had this discussion around um, the nature of abatement and that this is not giving up current tax revenue. It is an abatement on future revenue. In this case, I will point out that these are 10-year, 75% abatements. Uh, the reason that we're able to offer a less aggressive abatement on these is because these projects are built into smaller chunks. Um, so the market is not as incentive dependent um, from a competitive standpoint. That's all I would add. 
Thank you very much, Director Shoney. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 1647, 2019, to authorize the Director of the Department of Deve Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with Mission XC LLC for building number one for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a total proposed capital investment of approximately 10,300,000, including 9,500,000 in real property improvements and 800,000 in furniture and fixtures in the creation of 10 new, net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated new annual payroll of approximately $353,600. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 1648, 2019, to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with Mission XC LLC for building number two for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a total proposed capital investment of approximately 7,100,000, including 6,500,000 6, in real property improvements and 600,000 in furniture and fixtures in the creation of 10 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated new annual pay payroll of approximately $353,600. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Next, I have ordinance 1649, 2019, to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with Mission XC LLC for building number three for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a total proposed capital investment of approximately $7,100,000, including $6,500,000 in real property improvements and $600,000 in furniture and fixtures in the creation of 10 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated new annual payroll of approximately 353600 Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Last but certainly not least, I would like to invite Tori Richardson, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Columbus Regional Airport Authority to the podium as I introduce Ordinance Number 1788-2019. To authorize the mayor to execute a new annexation agreement with the Columbus Regional Airport Authority and to execute any and all other documents and instruments necessary and in incident thereto and to declare an emergency. The new agreement will replace the existing annexation agreement entered between the City of Columbus and the Rickenbacker Port Authority on September 9, 1996 to establish for each party obligations related to annexation of RPA property to the city. The city and the CRAA believe that it is necessary to create a new agreement to incorporate updated provisions, processes, and maps as it relates to the development of the property owned by the CRAA that they wish to annex into the city. The new agreement also outlines how and when city services will be provided to the property. And so I know a lot of work went into this and there are some people that uh, within our Department of Development that probably deserve uh, many accolades for many years worth of work and I know it was a lot of work on all sides and so we thank you for that and certainly offer the floor to you at this time. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, President Hardin, President Pro Tem, Elizabeth Brown, Chair Remy, and fellow council members. We certainly appreciate this opportunity to speak in favor uh, this evening. On behalf of our President and CEO, Joe Nardoni, and our Airport Authority Board of Directors and entire staff, we want to thank you for this opportunity and the longstanding partnership that we've had with the city. Uh, Chair, as you mentioned, we have a number of directors in the audience, uh, as well as some of our staff members who have been working on this for several years, and most specifically with this agreement over the last couple of years. So we certainly are encouraged by uh, the consideration today. Uh, we're here to talk about one of the particular airports that we own and operate, and that's Rickenbacker International Airport. There's been a lot of good things happening down there. It continues to grow and continues to mature as an economic engine for our community. The ordinance for your consideration tonight ensures that the critical partnership between the city and the airport authority continues. Uh, as you mentioned, the annexation agreement will replace the original one signed in 1996. that expires later this month. 
Uh, and the central purpose of that is really to continue on with the development and the partnership to make sure that as we uh, develop land that we are able to annex it into the city. This uh, agreement basically covers about 2,800 acres. And with this partnership, we'll be able to provide uh, city utilities, city services to area employers that want to develop land in partnership with us and then turn around and expand the uh, tax base, the income tax base for the city. Uh, it has a potential to develop more than 7,700 jobs. And I will just also note that the city has been willing to commit $15 million to help further this development and support this growth. As demonstrated in a recent economic impact study, we know that the Rickenbacker International Airport today supports over 15,000 jobs, $880 million of payroll, with a direct annual economic impact of $2.5 billion to our local and state economy. Our master plan estimates that we should expect around 900% increase in cargo growth with e-commerce, and obviously, Rickenbacker has been a, a uh, provided a, a great global hub and is poised for additional growth. Uh, certainly on behalf of the Airport Authority, we want to thank you for your favorable consideration. Again, thank you for the partnership. Thank you for city uh, staff and council's consideration and work over the years to help continue to grow. We appreciate that. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Thank you, Tori. We really appreciate you coming down, and thank you to everyone at the, the Port Authority for all of your hard work. We appreciate it. Thank you, Director Shoney, I know you have a few words to, to add. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, Council Member Remy, uh, President Harden, members of Council. Um, I want to echo um, what Tori said. I think there were days when it felt like we had as many people working on this agreement as we had working on the crew. Um, because the complexity of the relationship that we have with the airports um, and the CRAA is um, critical and it is really genuinely one of the most important community development and economic development partnerships that we have in the city. So having a firm basis of that in an agreement was really important. I want to make sure to thank um, not just my team, but um, folks from utilities, service, the mayor's office, finance all chipped in. Um, we had a lot of meetings um, and a couple of really hot conference rooms that went way too late um, that got us to this point where we, I think we have a framework for the next 30 years. Uh, and I think a framework that not only helps the city but sets one of our most important partners up for some great financial success into the future. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We um, certainly appreciate all the hard work. Does anybody have any questions or comments this evening? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. And that is all I have in economic development this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The next committee to come before Council is the Health and Human Service Committee. Council Member Tyson chairs that committee. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you. President Harden, and I have ordinance number, I have ordinance number 1637-2019. It is to authorize the office of the mayor to enter into a contract with the Nationwide Children's Hospital to provide teen reproductive health education and support ce celebrate one's goal to improve improve reproductive health planning in its high priority neighborhoods and to authorize expenditure of $100,000 from the city's general government grant fund. This ordinance authorizes the office of the mayor to enter into a contract with the Nationwide Children's Hospital to lead teen reproductive health education and celebrate one high priority neighborhood, Linden, Franklin, Ten Hilltop, Northeast, Linden, Southside, Southeast, and the Near East. This contract will support the Celebrate One goal to improve reproductive health planning by implementing evidence-based teen pregnancy prevention programming in schools and community organizations that serve teens who are at the highest risk of becoming pregnant. Um, this curriculum will begin in the 2019-20, 2020 school year. It will start, it will be in seven middle schools um, for seventh graders. And we know that teen pregnancies between the ages of 15 and 19 account for 4.5 of all pregnancies in the Franklin County. 
eight additional Columbus City School Middle School, uh, Columbus City Schools Middle Schools will be added in 2020 and 2021. This curriculum is evidence-based and is used in districts throughout Ohio, including Cleveland and Cleveland Heights. This Get Real curriculum will emphasize social and emotional skills as a key component of a healthy relationships and responsible decision making. It will also promote abstinence from sex as, as safe and healthy choice for adolescents, providing a comprehensive understanding of sexual health, sexuality, and protection methods, and supports parents and other caring adults as the primary sexuality educator of their children through family activities that encourage dialogue between students and caring adults in their lives about sexual health topics. This curriculum is suitable for all teens, regardless of their sexual experience or sexual orientation, and is LGBTQ plus inclusive and trauma-informed. Evidence is, has been shown to decrease unplanned and unintended pregnancies, increase high school attendance, and both of which will increase a student's chance of graduating from high school on time. In my work with the Commission on Black Girls, it has become evident that we need programs like this that will help our young people understand their reproductive health. Implementing this program as a proactive strategy to address infant mortality is a step in the right direction. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Passed. Thank you. And my final piece of legislation is Ordinance number 1711-2019 to authorize the Board of Health to enter into a grant agreement with the Community Development for All People to support all people's fresh market and to authorize the appropriation and the expenditure within the Neighborhood Initiative Sub Fund and to declare an emergency. I'm going to ask Pastor John Egger to walk towards the podium, please. The Community Development for All People opened the All People's Fresh Market in 2014 and reopened in a new location in March of 2018. Community, community Development for All People responded to the community's desire for access to fresh fruit and vegetables by opening this new fresh market. Families at no cost to them can get a basket of fresh, non-processed foods, including fruits, vegetables, meat, bread and dairy items every day at the market. Increasing access to fresh, wholesome produce is one powerful way to impact the health of families and help them to stretch their food budgets. In 2018, the Community Development for All People off offered over 1 million, 1 million 500 pounds of produce serving over 27,000 people averaging 350 shoppers daily, 350 shoppers daily coming to get fresh fruit pro produce. The All People's Fresh Market supplements the Columbus Public Health's Creating Healthy Communities program goal of improving access and affordability of healthy food. This market also supports our food plan to increase access to healthy, healthy food, local food, and affordable food. And moreover, this market goes a step beyond by making it free for all. And so, um, again, Pastor Edgar, I thank you for your leadership and um, making sure that we are a community that is certainly caring about all the needs of our residents and certainly a basic need of having food. And Reverend Edgar, then the floor is yours to share additional comments. Thank you. Council President Hardin, Council Members, and Committee uh, Chairwoman, I am delighted to have just a moment to say thanks to all of you for your support of this important initiative. Uh, this market has expanded dramatically. Several of you have been there. In fact, uh, Council President helped to uh, tear apart pallets to create the <laughs> ceiling uh, in this fresh market, which is a conversion of a former drive-through beer and wine store. And it's, uh, it's an easy conversion. We kept a lot of the coolers. They don't have beer or wine, but they are crispers for fruits and vegetables. I, the one thing I want to emphasize is the dramatic desire of people 
people in our community of all the economic levels, including low-income folks, to eat healthy so they can live healthy. Uh, and this market that is almost exclusively fruits and vegetables has grown to be the single largest point of distribution of free food anywhere in the 20 county area served by Mid-Ohio Food Bank. In fact, as recently as last Friday, uh, Matt Habesh, uh, the head of Mid-Ohio Food Bank, told me that that place, 1,900 square feet, a former drive-through that's on Parsons Avenue, is now one of the 20 largest places in terms of food distribution in the entire United States. It is a testimony that people want to live healthy and want the opportunities uh, to be able to achieve that. So thank you very much. This grew way beyond our expectations, and your investment will help us to continue to ex extend this growth. We we gave you a statistic a couple of months ago of about 350 people a day who come through. That's now increased to 400, and last week we had 500 people in one day. Wow. You know, so we are grateful for what you're doing and believe it is a wonderful model that can be replicated across the community. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Edgar. I'm certain for your leadership, but what also it's saying that 550 people had to come there to yes. get food. Mm -hmm. And so it just, individuals who are working, mm -hmm. um, trying to make ends meet, uh, coming there, or th and those that may not be, but still trying to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, I'm glad we're able to participate, and certainly if we weren't participating, it, it would be a challenge for your organization at this level. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's good news that you're there. It's not, so, it's not great news that people have to come there to Amen. get the food. So <laughs> we're glad that you're there. But again, as a community, that just says something to each and every one of us that the numbers have grown from the last time we talked, 200 more people coming there on a daily basis. So it means we have work to do in our community. And I thank you for being a great partner of ours in many ways. But uh, if there are no other questions or comments, I'm going to move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My committee. The final committee to come before council is the Rules and Reference Committee, and I chair that committee. Uh, I have uh, one ordinance and then two appointments that I'll read from the floor. The first ordinance is Ordinance 1763-2019, is to enact new sections 107.02, 107.03, 107.04, and 107.05 of Columbus City Codes and to repeal current sections of 107.2, 107.3, 107.4, 107.5 of the Columbus City Codes to update and clarify code sections pertaining to campaign finance disclosure, disclosures for office holders, candidates, ballot, ballot issue committees, PACs, PCEs, and other uh, required filers in the City of Columbus. This update is uh, this update to the campaign finance law provides greater clarity and enhances disclosure transparency requirements, minimizes the likelihood that dark money will uh, seep into our elections. In 2018, Mayor, G Mayor Ginther proposed and council passed legislation to force the disclosure of political contributions and expenditures, set contribution limits for municipal candidates and contributors, require auditing of campaign finance reports, and to create a system to report and investigate alleged violations. Upon additional review of these sections, it became clear that further updates were necessary to align with state and federal law, as well as to ensure maximum disclosure. The new sections enacted will also provide additional definitions and reorder some of the pre previous language in these, uh, in these sections of, to increase uh, clarity. This legislation expands the definition of agent to include those who would responsibly, reasonably appear to authorize expenditures on behalf of campaign committees, as well as to expand the amount of time given to file election period communications uh, from 24 hours to 48 hours. It updates filing requirements to mirror state and federal laws by requiring independent expenditure entities to disclose all individual donors that contribute $200 or more uh, total to the entity. It raises the dollar amount, dollar limit requirement of those filing election period communication reports more closely mirroring the requirements of campaign finance reports by changing the amount of required for filing by individuals who pay their own communications from $100 to an aggregated amount of $1,000. And it revises the penalty and process for these code sections, also adding language indicating that a municipal ballot committee that receives a contribution from an entity 
that is unable or will, unwilling to identify donors must properly disclose, dispose of that contribution. Again, the tweaks to this campaign finance law is for greater clarity and to minimize dark money by enhancing requirements for disclosure and transparency. I move for passage. Are there any comments or questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please quote. I apologize. Uh, first, uh, I uh, move to amend. Please call. Excuse me. Please, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Amended. Now I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Ordinance is passed. I have uh, appointment uh, number A0098-2019. It's appointment of Brent Foley, 37 East Columbus Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43206, to serve on the German Village Commission, replacing Mark Ors uh, with a new term expiration date of June uh, 30th, 2020. If there are no questions or comments, I move for approval. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Appointed. Uh, the final piece of legislation is Ordinance A0102-2019. It's the reappointment of Anthony Hartke at 364 Jackson Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43206 to serve on the German Village Commission with a new term expiration date of June 30th, 2020. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for approval. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Ordinance is passed. If there is no further business before council, uh, I move for adjournment. Is there a second? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Meeting is adjourned.